We pray that you bless our service today. We desire the work of your spirit in our lives and we certainly need your grace in all this. And we uh, ask your blessings now in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, we'll read uh, verses 18 through 27 of will, and then we'll drop back and, and get started kind of where we left off. It says, Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. There we see a great change, a great shift in what Joel is saying. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith. And I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. And we mentioned last time, you know, that's still, you know, Israel is still a reproach. You know, There's still the majority of the world that has nothing or wants nothing to do in a positive way with the nation of Israel. And how the word Jew is often used in a derogatory manner. And um, so all that was part of um, what God allowed to happen to the people as a result of their uh, rebellion against him and, and their forsaking him. And God says he promises here to you know, turn that around at some point in Israel's future. But I will remove far off from you the northern army and will drive him into a land barren and desolate with his face toward the east coast and his hinder part towards the utmost sea when his stink shall come up and his ill savor shall come up because he has done great things. For the pastures of the wilderness do spring. For the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield her strength. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. <clears throat> and the floor shall be full of wheat, and the fat shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years and that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, by the great army which I sent among you. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied, and praise the name of your Lord, of the Lord your God, that has dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. And so promises there of, of great blessings on, on the nation of Israel. And um uh, as we began last time, we, we talked about the change that's in the, uh, the tone of the prophecy, the direction of the prophecy here at this point, how the Lord was jealous for his land. And in this sense, it, the word jealous is something used in a good sense. In other words, it's used in a bad way or a good way. Um, and we even, in thinking about most time with, with people, it's, it's a... <laughs> We are jealous for the wrong reasons or express it in the wrong way a lot of times. Whereas the Lord, when he's jealous, it's for the well-being. His jealousy is for the well-being of others uh, and his love for others. And he will have pity on them and uh, have compassion towards the Israelites instead of judgment. We were down at the bottom uh, paragraph here on page one of where we had left off. And... Um, says, God promised to protect Israelites against the army from the north. There in verse 20. The identity of the army is something that Bible scholars have long debated. You know, this is an issue that you know, different groups and different people have different ideas about. Some believe that this is a reference to another locust invasion due to the locust is being discussed in near context of the verse. You know, we can go on a few verses further and then mention the locusts again. And um, other scholars uh, believe it's unlikely that this is a reference to another locust invasion. And the reasons being, uh, the, the word northern can also be tra translated northerner in this section, which refers more to where the army originated from rather than the direction from which the attack came. Uh, locusts aren't native to the countries due to the north of Israel. You know, when you get on up into particular Turkey and, and some of those regions to the north of Israel, you know, that's not where the locusts originate from. They plague that part of the world. 
It is from the north that the evil would often come upon Israel. And I'll give you some scripture references here in regard to that. And you look these up, you see that uh, calamity or evil or, or something bad regarding Israel, it comes from the north often. And, um, you know, a lot of the nations that, that did attack Israel in the past, other than Egypt, you know, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, and so many others, that was the route that they came was from the north. And so some of these scriptures I have listed here are in reference to those countries. Uh, as a result, many scholars believe it is a reference to a human army rather than to a locust army. Some believe that it is a reference to the Assyrians since God supernaturally delivered Jerusalem from the Assyrians. You remember that story? You know, Isaiah 36 through 39, King Hezekiah and his prayer and the desperate situation they were in there and, and the uh, spokesman for Sennacherib and, and uh, he was trash talking Hezekiah and Jerusalem and actually trash talking God and I think that's when the Lord says enough's enough and you know that night 185,000 Assyrians died and what, who were left went back to went back home <laughs> and uh, so we do know that God had supernaturally in a powerful way demonstrated his uh, greatness there in delivering the Jews and the city of Jerusalem at that time. Others believe it's a reference to the Babylonians. You know, they came along uh, a little over 100 years later, and of course they conquered the Assyrians and, and took over the Assyrian kingdom, and then they came on down, and, and a lot of the other nations, uh, Israel and surrounding them, they attacked. And of course, then uh, the Babylonians weren't long lived till they were conquered by the Medes and Persians, and and um, you know so, but due to their pride, and due to their wickedness, and others believe this is a reference to the invasion spoken of by Ezekiel, which will take place some point in the future. When you look to Ezekiel 38, 39, and and I'm kind of in favor of that as well. And uh, you know, a group of nations that start from the north and come against Israel. And that's you know, yet to be in the future. And the reaction may not be that far in the future. Um, you know, the deals with Russia now in, in the Middle East and, and, and uh, Iran, which is Persia in the Bible. You know, you have these nations, the players who are, are part of that prophecy or are active in the area just north of, of Israel at this point. Now, God does promise to take care of Israel here. And it says, in protecting Israel, God states that he will destroy the army. The description of how the Lord will do that does not align with how the accounts of how God destroyed the Assyrian army or how the Babylonians were conquered. So that's where, you know, when you look at how God dealt with the Assyrians, how God dealt with the Babylonians, what we have here in Joel you know, doesn't align up exactly with, with those other, uh, other two. And... Um, what it does say here that some of the army be destroyed near the Dead Sea, or reference here to the East Sea, so that's the Dead Sea, and then others towards the Mediterranean Sea, the utmost sea, that of course lies to the west of uh, Israel. The horrible odor released from the decaying corpses will be great. You know, I've never been on a battlefield or around a battlefield. Uh, some people say it's horrific. You know, all the dead bodies that are there and the odor that comes up. You know, you're driving along the road or somewhere and you, know, <laughs> you have a deer or something got hit and just lay there for two or three days. It makes a pretty horrific smell. Mm -hmm. And uh, But if you multiply that by thousands and thousands and thousands, mm -hmm. it can get pretty pretty rough. And so it would certainly be something that would not be pleasant. The army from the north had set out to do great things in their conquest of Israel. The great things done by the army were only great in their own estimation. You know, that's the way we are. A lot of times we kind of self-inflate, you know, what, who we are and what we do. And, and in reality, before God, we're not much. And, you know, even today, there's people in the world who I think they've got a body this big around the head the size of the moon. And, you know, in God's sight, you know, they're, they're not very great. They had sought to bring destruction upon God's people and his land, and in their pride, they had imagined themselves to be greater than they actually were. And it was the Lord who will actually do great things. 
there in verse 21, we see, fear not, O land. In other words, don't be afraid of these attackers. Don't be afraid of what's going to come against you. Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. And, um, you know, we have in the Bible, So often, I think we forget it. We get in a, in a tight place in life or a hard place in life, and, and sometimes our faith is maybe not what it ought to be, and, and we forget you know, the power of God. And, and uh, just like Hezekiah, and you know, even some of the people I think didn't support him in his seeking the Lord to stand against the Assyrians, and yet God honored that faith and, and delivered the people at that time. So, encouragement to us to look to God when things are hard and um, things are difficult. Instead of being fearful, God exhorted the land to be glad and rejoice. God's deliverance always brings gladness and joy. Doesn't it feel good when God does bring you through something? Mm -hmm. You know that? That God has done something for you? You know, and you, you have that joy, you have that gladness of knowing the Lord has helped you through and, and saw you through. Instead of the animals being afraid and crying unto God, you go back to chapter 1, verse 20, you know, we, we see the beasts of the field crying and uh, so forth and so on because of the circumstance they were in. They can rejoice because of the abundance of food to eat. There in verse 22, you'll see that. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field. See, some of this language here at this point is just the very opposite of what was mentioned in chapter 1. You see the complete 180 degree shift from chapter 1 to, to this point in Joel's prophecy. The fruit trees and the fig trees and the grapevines for thy great harvest. There it says, for the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. It means, you know, they're going to bear abundantly and, and they're going to give a full crop. And uh, the very opposite of what was going on back in chapter 1. When the locusts came through and the drought came through and the trees, even the trees, some of them were stripped of their bark and, and you know, no fruit, nothing. And so we see here just the very opposite, and, and God's blessing in that. Instead of experiencing drought conditions, God will provide sufficient rain and seasons needed for the Israelite crop to produce great harvest. We see that in verses 23 and 24. It says, Be glad, then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, the latter rain in the first month. And the floor should be full of wheat, and the fat shall overflow with wine and oil. In other words, where they went to, you know, dumped in the grapes and stomped out the juice and <laughs> put in the olives and pressed out the oil, you know, it's going to be overflowing. You know, it's going to be such an abundant harvest. And, you know, the threshing floor mentioned there about the wheat, the grain where they had. And so God is blessing materially in a great way. The word moderately, uh, there at the beginning of the verse, is actually the word for ripeness. In the former rain, rightly. It refers to the fact that God will act in righteousness and in faithfulness to his promises. And if you go back to Deuteronomy in chapter 11, you see a promise of God to the Israel. And, and um, Says, it shall come to pass if you shall hearken diligently unto my commandments which I command you this day to love the Lord your God to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul that I will give you the rain of your land in his due, in his due season the first rain and the latter rain that thou mayest gather thy corn and thy wine and thy oil you know the things that are mentioned here in Joel as far as crops you know the grain and the, uh, the wine and the oil and I will send grass in thy fields for thy cattle and thou mayest eat and be full and so there is a promise in Deuteronomy, of God's materially blessing the Jews if, if they loved the Lord and obeyed Him and, and kept His covenant. And so we see that God upholds His side of the deal, so to speak. And sometimes God upholds His side of the deal in spite of the actions on the part of the other. And we see, I think, your God moving sovereignly and, and preparing Israel for the restored Israel. You know, He's, he's blessing and preparing the land to receive, you know, the people. And um, this would be the means by which the meat 
and the drink offerings can be offered to the Lord again. Remember back in chapter 1 that you know they didn't have what they needed to, to um, make their offerings to God. And, and you know that was because their relationship with God had gotten severed due to their sin. And so God took it away. He, he prevented that opportunity. Because they weren't, you know, as we talked about then, it, it didn't mean anything. You know, they were just going through the rituals, going through the motions. And it wasn't from their heart. The reason for rejoicing is twofold. First, there's rejoicing due to having plenty to eat and plenty to feed their livestock. And second, I think this is more important, the nation's relationship with God is being restored. You know, that's more important than having plenty to eat, is to have the right relationship with God. And, and uh, you know, being able to fellowship with God. And... Uh, God promised to restore the people's losses experienced due to God's judgment when he sent his army there in verse 25. And I'll restore you the years that the locusts have eaten, the cankerworm, the caterpillar, the palmworm, my great army which I sent among you. And you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God. The phrase, I will restore, is a legal term that was used in reference to restitution made for the damages incurred by offending parties. You know, Maybe for whatever reason, I go down to Howard's house and I tear up something. <coughs> and I'm, I, oh, I'm in debt to Howard. And so I say, all right, I'm going to make it right, Howard. I'm going to restore, or I will restore the damage. And so that's the idea behind this phrase and this term. And so God's promising Israel he would restore the damage so to speak, that was incurred by, you know, the locust plagues and what they suffered. The Lord promised to make full compensation to Israel for the losses experienced in the plague of locusts is on severe drought, even though Israel was the offending party and had no right to make a claim for what was lost. You know, that's the grace of God, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That is the grace of God. And, and, you know, God often treats us that way, doesn't he? You know, how much God does for us and blesses us when we're so undeserving. And uh, there's a little quote here. Repentance has made such a revolution problem possible. Divine grace made it actual. You know, you know, repentance comes as a result of God's grace, and then the blessings that follow behind that are by God's grace as well. And a quote from C. Ron Morelli, you know, Bible scholar. In her repentant state, Israel will acknowledge that it is the Lord that has made all the wonderful things happen for the restoration of the nation. Remember when we studied Hosea, and in particular the northern kingdoms, and under Jeroboam too, and God had blessed the nation in spite of their sin, and Jeroboam too was a proud man, and the Israelites were proud, and they were saying, you know, look what we did, look what, you know, what we accomplished, and how great we are. And one soon after that, you know, the nation fell. But here we see the people saying, and they will be satisfied and praised in the name of the Lord your God, and who dealt wondrously for you. And it says, my people shall never be ashamed. In fact, it's said twice here at the end of the chapter. The promises that are made in verses 27 and 28 are yet to be fulfilled. Um, the nation will never experience conditions like what it was endured during the locust invasion or the invasion of the army from the north. You know, again, Instead of praising Baal or some false god or becoming proud in their own accomplishments, the Israelites will praise the name of the Lord because he dealt wonderfully with them. Paul means something wonderful or something marvelous. What the Lord will have done for the Israelites is so great that it cannot be explained except as God demonstrating his care. There's no other way to explain it. And the Jews at that time will recognize there's no other way to explain this. But it was the work of the Lord. He will do, in addition to displaying his infinite power, will be the means by which his mercy will be extended to you. And so God is, will be at work in, in a great way among the Israelites. <coughs> After the nation's deliverance and restoration, the Israelites will know that the Lord is in the midst of Israel. There in uh, verse 27. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. There's a promise there made to them. This is a reminder of God's presence with the nation at the time he delivered them from Egypt and made a covenant with them on Mount Sinai. You remember as they traveled through the wilderness, you know, there was a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud. And God was saying, you know, I am present with you. I'm 
I'm here with you along this journey. And, and so here's the promise again of God's renewed presence in the midst of the nation. He'll be there with them again. And um, the question asked of those who, that reproached Israel there in, in 2.17, you know, says, where is their God? Remember, we finished up last time that lesson. You know, they were reproached, and those enemies would say, well, where is your God? You know, that allowed this to happen to you. It allowed you to go into bondage and allowed these terrible things to happen. You know, where is your God? Mm -hmm. Now that the question will be answered in the positive way, he's right here with us. That's right. <laughs> he is right here with us. And, and uh, uh, it will be answered in the matter that silences any that would seek to steal, scorn the nation. When not only will Israel know that the Lord is with them, <laughs> the other nations around them will know the Lord is with them. And it'll be undeniable and, and fully evident you know, for everybody. The irrefutable evidence of the Lord's presence among the Israelites was seen in his protecting and caring for them. And we, through history, we see this. And I've given you some, some quotations regarding that. Some of them we'll look at when we look at some of these other minor prophets in Micah and Zephaniah. Never again will the Israelites be ashamed. The word boosh means to just become red in the face and, <laughs> and uh, you know, embarrassed about things. And, you know, never again will the Israelites you know, be a reproach or be looked down upon. So to conclude this, there's all the things the nation has experienced, both good and bad, will result in the Israelites knowing that the Lord is their God. And that's a principle that can apply to us. Sometimes we have to go through the bad things, the difficult things, and experience the deliverance of God you know, to realize the Lord is with us. Sometimes God takes us through and blesses us, and we have the sense enough in our head to know that God is with us and has blessed us. And, and so for Israel, the parent will take both. Throughout the Old Testament, God repeatedly referred to Israel as my people, even when the nation was not faithful to him. We saw that in Hosea, and we see it here. After being restored, the Israelites will understand God's holiness. They'll understand his faithfulness. They'll understand his power. They'll understand his mercy. They'll understand his love. And all of these things will become very evident to them. And, and they'll, they'll, they'll have a handle on it, so to speak. And, and uh, it'll be a part of their thinking in their minds. There will be no doubt in their minds that he alone is God. You know, there won't be this business of dabbling around with Baal or uh, Molech or any of these gods of the other nations, you know, or materialism or any other bit of it. They will have no desire to put any of the gods before them. In other words, where they broke that one of the Ten Commandments and bringing other things before God in their lives, no longer will that be a problem. All that the nation has experienced in its history, God at God's hand will create a sense of assurance in him and a reverential fear for him. The Lord's presence among the people and their faithful obedience to him as the one and only true God will together determine that they will never be ashamed again. And we'll finish this up with a little quote from John Watts. And we ought to be glad about this similar thing. God does not relinquish his claim to his people to any other God. You know, what happened when they chose to follow Baal? You know, God got after them. He let them know that I'm not going to put up with this. And why was that? Because it wasn't the best thing for them. And, and uh, nor does he allow them to look at any of them. God can have no rival in his people's loyalty. And really that's uh, <coughs> be something, something for us as, as believers in Christ. You know, and you know, how often we have a tendency to get our eyes kind of sideways at something or allow something to kind of draw our hearts away from him. And you know, God doesn't appreciate that. God doesn't like that. And, and, uh, and as his children, you know, he chastens us to, to either prevent us from getting into something that we shouldn't or to get us out of something that we shouldn't. And, and that's because he loves us and he wants the best for us. All right, lesson five. We've got a few minutes left here. The last five verses of this chapter two. And uh, you might say, well, that's a whole lot of information on a few verses. 
I was telling Brian before I got started this morning that actually I finished working on this while I was at the beach. I took my computer with me and some books and some spare time. I, that's what I did some. And, and I actually spent quite a bit of time with these verses. And, and um, because, you know, I think it's important and, and uh, and at the same time, there's some things, some conclusions you come to that you maybe can't be absolutely dogmatic about. Let's put it that way. Yeah. And, and um, because in studying, there's, there's really good Bible scholars who you know, have different views on some things, and they have their defenses for what they believe. And so we'll, we'll work through this. And, and because what we read here in these verses here, part of this Peter, on most of it, Peter quotes in, on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2. And so we want to try to see, well, what does that mean for us in the church? And, and why did... <laughs>
page 
Wilson family. They are missionaries to Ghana. They are actually nationals there. And they're serving with Rock of Ages Ministry based out of Athens, Tennessee. They ask that we pray for the monthly needs of overseas ministry. They also offer praise for a shipment of new Bibles. So let's keep them in our prayers not only today, but throughout this week. And don't forget that uh, all the, there's a trip with, for the seniors and anybody else who would like to tag along. On November the 3rd, Miss Norma Lee has some, a few tickets left. So if you would like to do that to the Whitfield show, the Christmas show, just talk to her and she'll get you plugged in. Don't forget that this afternoon we will be going to the nursing home and we will meet here at 2.30. Today we'll be going over to Friendship uh, Rehabilitation Center right across the road over in Starkey. And then we have our evening service uh, this evening at 6 o'clock. we got regular Bible study and prayer meeting this Wednesday along with our kids club, uh, youth classes and everything that's going on. And Saturday, September the 30th, we're having a gospel sing, and I do want to apologize. Some of you have been asking about the spiritual letters coming, and I thought, uh, anyways, to make a long story short, I got the dates mixed up, and so I contacted them and let them know that we will have to get them back to come at another time. But we have several of our church members here. I know our Gospel Music Fellowship and several of the others, and if anybody else wants to be involved in our gospel scene, let me know. And all the proceeds are going to be going towards our building fund. We have the dinner at 5 o'clock, and then the scene's going to start at 6.30, so please take note of that. Our Fall Revival and Missions Conference is coming up very, very uh, close, so just in a couple weeks here, so we'll be praying about that. And then Saturday, October the 14th, is the Ladies' Fellowship meeting. And then on Saturday, October the 21st, um, as I said last week, if you... Um, we're able to go ahead and mark out the walkathon because instead of the walkathon, uh, Miss Mabel has this great idea, Miss Mabel Elmore, about having an old fashioned day. Just imagine the yard sale we had over the summer and a whole lot more. It's going to be a big festival. She's calling it an old fashioned day, and they're going to meet at 1 o'clock this Tuesday with Miss Darlene and Miss Mabel um, in the fellowship hall. So if you're able to come out and help them meet and take care of some of the essentials, please uh, come on out. And then also don't forget that our our um, Halloween trunk or treat is coming up on, set on whenever October the 31st is. I can't recall the exact day. Is it a, what day is it? It's a Tuesday, so please take note of that. We're going to have a sign out there. We're going to be doing some promotion with, with our Old Fashioned Day and then with our uh, trunk or treat, you know, uh, on Facebook. So we want you to share that when we get that up there. And by the way, speaking of Facebook, um, if you have not discovered it already, we want you to go to our church's page and like our Facebook page. And we have this awesome camera sitting over here, and we are actually live right now on Facebook. So if you have your phones, I want you to get them out. This is the only time I'm going to allow you to get your phones out there. So, and I want you to share the live a video right now because what we want to do is we want to reach people that are not in church. So if your friends or family that you have on Facebook are not in church anywhere, we want them to be exposed to our service here so that they can potentially hear the gospel and get saved and come and partake in our worship service here. So if you want to do that at some point during the service, I would encourage you to do that. And thanks to Brother Paul Richards and some of the others for helping us out with this ministry. We're excited about how the Lord is going to move. And by the way, just an update, we, we tested out on Facebook on Wednesday evening. And that night after the service, we probably had 20 or 25 people here in our prayer meeting. So if you don't do anything on Wednesdays, come out and join us while all the other workers are down there. But we have already over 400 views to that one service, which is really cool. Uh, so be, be sure to check all that stuff okay. out. A bit of humor for today says, The Sunday school teacher was happy to hear that little Johnny's mom said prayers for him each night. So she asked Johnny what she prayed. Johnny answered, Thank God he's in bed. All right. I'm sure we'll all get that one at lunchtime later today. Don't forget to check out the martyrs paragraph on our bulletin. And our Bible verse for today comes from Colossians chapter 3. It says, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Well, with all these thoughts in mind, Brother Wayne, let's get our song. <laughs> Something that would sound 
the one we just read a few moments ago in our bulletin. So repeat after me. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Oh, excuse me. I messed up. Not Colossians chapter 2. Let's try it again. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Verse 2. Verse 2. Set your affection. Set your affection. On things above. On things above. Not on things. Not on things. On the earth. On the earth. All right, let's try one more time. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Verse 2. Verse 2. Set your affection. Set your affection. On things above. On things above. Not on things. Not on things. On the earth. On the earth. Okay, say affection with me on three. One, two, three. Okay. Affection. affection. Say it again. Affection. affection. One more time, please. Everybody together on three. One, two, three. Affection. affection. How many of you have an idea what that word means? I know it's a big word. Any clues? Nope, 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 nope. <laughs> well, I'm going to give you a hint. It starts with L and rhymes with dove. That's right. Good job, Ruthie. How'd you guess that? All right, so say love with me on three. One, two, three. Love. 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 The word affection simply means love or our heart's desire. So here when the Bible is speaking here, Paul's writing these believers in Colossae, and he says set your affection or your heart on, make sure that the things that you love are from your heart are not on things in this earth, but on things that are in heaven. So I want to share this little statement with you. Set your affection on heaven. You think you can remember that? I'm going to say it one more time. I want you to say it with me. Set your affection on heaven. Say it with me on three. One, two, three. Set your affection on heaven. All right. So let's make sure our heart's desire is always looking towards heaven. Let's pray together, and you'll be on your way to your classes. Father, we thank you so much for your word. God, we thank you for this passage of scripture. We thank you for the book of Colossians and the truth here. And God, we pray that you would not just help these boys and girls, but you'd help all of us here today to make our heart's desire upon heaven and upon eternity. And so, Lord, we ask that you would bless these young people as they go to their classes now, empower each of the workers with, their, with your spirit, and use them in a great and mighty way as they minister the word of God to them. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 